Lethbridge, Alberta is known for its wide prairie landscapes and towering bridge, but the city is much more than its breathtaking vistas. Located two hours south of Calgary, it's home to a diverse and growing community. In this episode of Why I Love, three local filmmakers introduce us to some of the people who make Lethbridge a great place to live. Yash Senda built his famous judo gym in Lethbridge, and it has reached international success. Now a new generation is carrying on his legacy. My name is Troy Galant. Uh, hi, I'm Carter Altos. It's Charlize Medellis. I'm Evelyn Beaton. I personally, I like, I don't do anything the night before. I just sleep early that night and wake up early. I eat breakfast and listen to music for, for my fights. That's all I do before my fights. Anything after is whatever, but before my fights, it's literally just me. Rap, hip hop, something that's gonna pump me up, yeah. The thrill of the competition, I love traveling internationally and competing for my team, my country, it's one of the best feelings. Uh, the big start of a match is always a lot of nerves, like I don't know if I'm going to beat this guy, even though I beat him last tournament, I don't know if I'm going to beat this guy this time, maybe he's got something new. There's always like that nerves at the beginning of a match. Middle of the match is kind of, you kind of go blank almost, you just listen to what your coach says and you just fight for your life basically. End of the match, obviously results in how you did that match, so if you lost, so there's a lot of emotion. When you win, though, it's it's pretty, it's a good high. Um, I'm very anxious when I compete because sometimes I get like the little sudden hints of doubt if I can compete well enough and if I can win the match. But as soon as I get onto the mat and like I'm ready and like focused, then I know I can win pretty easily, so. Okay, can I just ask a question? Like how far back? Like there's two tournaments in a week, one in Quebec, one in Ontario, and I won both those tournaments, which gave me the opportunity to go to London and I won the tournament that was in London. I won my first national championships, won elite national U18, and then national that champion. gave me the opportunity to go to Germany. And I managed to get a bronze medal there. Won uh, the national championship. Championship. I went Olympics. to Italy. I also got second U18 place, and I was really happy. Yeah. So I'm really proud of. So the Lethbridge Judo Club has had always had a rich uh, tradition with uh, Mr. Senda and, and the program that he was running all those years. And then uh, it transitioned over to the next generation. And the next generation really kind of put a process and a plan that wasn't just about, you know, practicing and seeing what is gonna be done or seeing, you know, maybe these results will happen. The next generation said, hey, let's make a plan that's gonna bring us towards excellence. Let's produce Olympians, let's produce world-class uh, athletes, let's produce the best age group that we possibly can because we have to transfer our athletes over to the national team. So let's get nationally recognized and try to sustain it for the longest period of time. Yoan Beaton, my position is I'm the provincial judo coach for Judo Alberta, and I'm also the regional training center coach here in Lethbridge. Russ Gallant got named as the head coach in 2013 here at the club and been serving that position ever since. Back in the, the 70s, the Lethbridge Judo Club had a few players that were part of the Team Canada, along with the coach, Mr. Senda. So they went to the Olympics. We have a four-time Olympian living right here in Lethbridge, Joe Malley. So I came in right in the middle of the Olympics, big excitement. The other thing that was kind of cool was, I believe it was 1984, I think that was right around the same time Karate Kid came up, the original Karate Kid, and that's when I noticed so many kids joining martial arts at that time, right? Everybody was the next karate kid. So I remember those things when I, when I was young, seeing how many kids wanted to get involved. So we had a lot of momentum when we were young, a lot of people in the club. From an early age, I always remember 
going to judo practice, and the one thing I always noticed was Mr. Sendo was always there. And as he got older, I noticed he was still there. I know it wasn't convenient for him to always be there, but he was there. I always looked at it and said, if Mr. Sendo can show up to judo, and he's really old, and he's had some health issues, what excuse do I have? So those values of hard work, always being present and trying your best, those values stuck with me. And to this day, every judo practice, I am still there. Hair shops in Lethbridge introduced director Dominique Schall to black culture. Many can learn about their history and ancestors in these small centers. It's always been so much more than what you see. Hours of plates, locks, and twists speak to the history of our ancestors, our salvation, and perseverance to a group of people displaced amongst the world. Among the diaspora, hair speaks on grand terms. The same way that food can represent a multitude of flavors, color, and aroma that speak to the experiences of the chef that created it, hair instead speaks to where you came from and where you're going. I think it's better for an African woman like to grow your own natural hair because it brings who you are. That is the beauty of um, an African woman. In pre-colonial African societies, black hair was seen as a symbol of a person's identity. Whether you were royalty, a soldier going off to war, or a mother about to give birth, the signature style that you wore your hair in would speak to your place among society. In modern day North America, your place in society is still defined by how your hair looks. There's just more restrictions in place to police the art of it now. When I came here, I came with uh, my natural hair. Uh, it was braided, but when, when I start uh, like the life here, going to work and other things, and sometimes you don't have access to going to salon because they don't have time and sometimes you don't have the money. So, which is different back home. Like um, using um, wig is another, a substitute to braiding your hair. So back home, it's not difficult to do hair because there's many people around the corner. When you're a little girl, your mom, maybe she can do it for you, or maybe somebody like friends or will, will do it for you, but your mom uh, makes sure his little girl is, be is beautiful. Well, that was a big memory because that's what we do back home. So like um, you can just call your mom or maybe your sibling to do your hair and it's, uh, they will do it right away. Yeah, so like, uh, like a mystique was here and I say, oh, can you do my hair? She say, oh yeah, sure. Then she now braided it, yeah. Where our ancestors worked hard to anoint themselves with the tools that they had, we now have a vast selection. Enslaved Africans weren't allowed to use combs or herbal hair treatments from their homeland. Oftentimes, bacon grease, butter, or the highly flammable kerosene, as well as sheep brushes, were a few of the very limited resources accessible to many of the enslaved for grooming. The absence of has led to the abundance of products available today. The same braids filled with seeds to sustain us during enslavement have provided Black women industry and growth in our modern setting. The places that you do see hide in plain sight. I've been in Ledbury since uh, 1999. We moved from Vancouver to Lethbridge. When I was in Vancouver, I, I used to sew, like I was a seamstress, and then I used to bring stuff from Africa, like ready-made clothing, and sell them like in Vancouver. So when I came here, I continued selling the dresses, and then people were asking for hair extensions, yeah. So I brought in, I started selling hair extensions and then they wanted creams. So that's how it went on. Mm, there were a few black people, there weren't that many black people. We used to get together sometimes, yeah, and then we invite a couple of other Africans. So that was all the black community we had then has grown a lot. A lot of people, a lot of black people have come to Lethbridge. A lot of students, Afri uh, international students. And so they, they all do their hair, so it has grown. As black people, we've had the unique opportunity to thrive all over the world in many aspects of society. 
Over time, like initially, I didn't know much about hair. So it was just the basic for braiding. And then people started asking more like weaves and then wigs. So it has grown. And when I wanted to set up the shop, I was actually looking at African food and stuff. But my son said, like, there's no hair extension shop in Ledbury. So but I had the food, but I wanted people to see the hair more because uh, that sells more. And there are a lot of young people who are always doing their hair. So yeah, lots of different stuff like Initially, people were just braiding and then using the extension. And then some people went into chemically treating their hair. But now I see that it has changed. More people are going natural. Yeah, they don't want to chemically process their hair anymore. They are going natural. So even if they put on extensions, like they want the natural looking one so that uh, people will not be able to tell it's fake, yeah. I feel like it's for everyone. Everyone is welcome, so. Shops hidden in U-Haul buildings and next to local restaurants have become staples in a town as small as Lethbridge. Lethbridge is home to many immigrants who came to the city in search of a new start. For director Gianna Isabella, it is a story that hits close to home. Well, Sunday is a very special day. Um, it's a family day, and we try to gather all of our children and grandchildren together for pasta dinner. It's a tradition that's been handed down from Romano's family, Romano's dad. So it's a great way to reconnect it's lovely to gather them around the table on a Sunday and uh, just to talk about their week and how, how it went for them and all of that. So their trials and tribulations <laughs> and joys. <laughs> well, I learned it from my father and my mother because my mother learned how to make it from my father as well. So it's basically a stew, if you want to call it that. So there's meat in it and tomato. You can put whatever you want in it for, um, if you want it spicy or not or whatever. There's so many things you can do to change it. And it's based on a tomato sauce. So that's basically it. It's made with love, Dad. It's made with love, yeah. And cook the pasta so it's al dente. <laughs> And the first time I ever saw a Jag Mark II was, I think I was about eight years of age. And I was walking uptown past the garage and they had one in the showroom. And it was green. And I remember looking in at it and they had a poster on the wall of a Jag in a showroom with a little boy standing outside saying, Someday, I will have one of those. And I said, right, I'm going to have one of those someday. The economy in Ireland was such that we had lost everything that we had worked for in the 15 years of our marriage. We lost our home. We lost our businesses. We needed to start afresh somewhere. And Ireland wasn't the place, especially for the children. It was really all about the children and to try and make a better life for them. I was driving through County Galway, looked down into a farmer's field and there was a red jag sitting in the middle of the field, rotting away. So I went in and asked him, was he selling it? And he said, no, you can just take it away. I don't want it. And from there, I started to rebuild it. And so when we came here to Canada, um, for the first good few months, it was very, very difficult, very hard to settle in to a brand new lifestyle. Um, 
It was like as if we lost all our family and friends back in Ireland in one go. We had decided to come to Canada. The day we were leaving was the first time I drove my Jag after building it and my last time driving it. When we settled in our rented home, there was a great sense of community in that street. We had lovely neighbours and, um, and that really helped us very much. And then the fact that the children started off going to school, the two older ones, and um, they were beginning to settle. Children are very <laughs> adaptable, actually, way more adapt adaptable than their parents. And then uh, Romano was able to get a job very quickly. And um, we started to, to, to blend into this Canadian life. And um, it did take a long time, but they're the reasons why. And then I got a job later on, about three or four months later. And through that, um, again, that sense of community and you make friends with people whom you work with. Um, but also our um, faith really helped us an awful lot. We became members of St. Patrick's Church right downtown, a beautiful church that reminded us so much of Ireland. And we probably turned a curve after a little over a year. It's an interesting thing. The first time I really felt very homesick, homesick for my family and my school friends and that. And I think that's just that, that part that still draws at the heartstrings all the time is how much you miss them but um, but still I think we've definitely made the right decision I would never regret it sometimes I have to say I do get homesick and it's nasty but it doesn't last that long there's always something else I have to do so we have been married 45 years on the 1st of July. <laughs> we thought it was very nice that they were celebrating the 1st of July for us. Yes, initially, we did, yeah. didn't we? <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you, when you have to leave your country and make your life in a new country, it's always about the ch your children, your family. And... Um, what's best for them and if they can make it here. And so um, I'm very, very pleased that all four have become very successful in their adult lives. They all um, availed of further education in college and university and uh, became very successful. So we are very grateful for that. <laughs> That's why we did it. <laughs> You always have a little longing from places where you've lived, as a child especially. That's the kind of goes and comes. It, you never really forget where you came from. Building a life in Lethbridge means finding your own community. As director Arjun Gill discovered, that can sometimes take you to the cricket field. I am Simranjit Singh. I'm 22 years old. In 2019, I moved here in Canada and I love playing cricket. When I told my parents about moving to Canada, at first they were not quite happy actually. They didn't want me to leave the country and they wanted me to stay with them, but I made them understand that I have to go for my further education so I could get a better job. It was actually hard because I didn't know what to do and where to go. I always had to call my other friends living in other cities, like, where should I go for this thing and where should I go for that? But when I moved here, I got an opportunity to be enrolled in a criminal justice program. That's when I realized maybe I could become a police officer. I had no friends here. I didn't know anyone. I just moved in with some people and then we started to go to college and I made some new friends, Navdeep Singh. I met him in uh, college and then we started playing cricket and 
He's been a great, great support to me ever since I came here. In, at every uh, stage of my life, he has helped me. And still we are staying together and we still pray uh, together. And also I have another friend, Harpreet Singh. He's also from India. And I, I met him in, in college. And then that's how we started playing cricket. We realized that we can play cricket. There was a ground right outside our place. So we started to play cricket after our school. We usually call it gully cricket because we don't follow all the rules that, is, that are followed in professional cricket. So in gully cricket, basically, you just have small place to play cricket. And also we have the less players in gully cricket. So even if you belong to batting team, you, you will still be fielding for the other team just to fill up the spaces. So in cricket, there are two types of bowlers, the fast bowlers and the spin bowlers. The fast bowlers are known for their swings, while the spinners, uh, they, bowl, they bowl slower ones, but they have to turn their ball and they use the pitch as well. The thing that I about, like about bowling is uh, the pressure is always on the batsman. Like for example, if 10 runs are required in the last over, then the bowler is uh, on the driving seat because the batsman has to hit the ball to win the match. The bowler just have to ball in the right areas and you just have to beat the batsman. Actually, I love batting. Uh, I love batting more than the bowling. And I'm, I'm a left-handed batsman, which is pretty rare in cricket. It's always great when you hit it. Like for the bowler, it's it, it's very sad moment, but for the batsman, it's always great. And public enjoys it. People always love watching batsmen hitting the sixes. It was like, it, 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 was, it was great while playing cricket. And when, whenever you hit, you hit the six, the bowler would get mad at you. He would try to hit the ball hard. And it, it was always like a, a fighting between batsman and the bowler. Harpreet is uh, the most aggressive person while playing cricket. He always just wants to win. And if in situation he is like unable to do something, then he would get mad and just throw things away. <laughs> Uh, I also play for fun. Uh, as I already said, I love batting, so while batting, I just try to hit the ball hard. If it connects, then it will be a six. If not, then maybe I'll get out. Yeah, like, while I'm on work, I have to be professional all the time. I work as a security guard, talking to people all the day. And But when we play cricket, we just forget about that. We, we play like kids. The thing that I love the most about the cricket is uh, we can, like, chill with their friends, even if you go to your job and then in, in the evening time you can play with your friends and you can have fun time. I would love to have my school friends with me if I'm playing my last game because we played together ever since we were in school and yeah I would also like my cousin brothers to be there because they always cheer me up when we used to play in India so I would love to uh, if, they, if they would be with me while playing my last game. Lethbridge is a diverse and growing city full of passionate people. Who inspires you in your community? Tell us about them at communitycontent at We'll see you soon.